so at this at this time, I'd like to introduce Suzanne Ballet Haight of uh, Ballet Flowers and Designs, a wonderful garden shop. If you've been there, it's just like heaven this time of year to go in and you can get a little bit. Are, are you actually open, Suzanne, yet? Uh, we're doing curbside pickup online. You can order on our website through our online shopping. Okay. So people can come and pick up items at the greenhouse or it's by appointment. If somebody really wants to come through and, uh, you know, look themselves at seed packets and things like that. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, Suzanne, you can, uh, um, we'll start the recording now and um, you, you may start, take it away. Okay. Thank you. My name is Suzanne ballet Haight, and today we're going to talk about creating a wildflower hab habitat and pollinator garden. Uh, it's it's one of those things that I think is uh, it, a very eco-friendly thing to do. And I think there's, whoops. Okay, uh, the, uh, my arrows were working for a minute. Um, so what is important with a wildflower garden uh, is providing what's most important for the wildlife. So you need food, water, and shelter. So food could be the pollen or seeds. Uh, water is a water source such as this um, that has a way for butterflies or birds to get a, a drink. And shelter can be a larger shrub or a larger plant that grows. And the, the animals could hide under it or find food underneath a, a shrub or a plant. And I just wanted to point out what I have on the screen. So this is a monarch butterfly on Asclepius uh, tuberosa, which is butterfly weed. We have a zinnia and you can see in the center of the zinnia that there's a lot of pollen there. Great for bees, butterflies, and uh, actually hummingbirds love zinnias as well. And this is lisianthus, which you can see the center, the pollen is very strong in the center of this. And petunias are also great for hummingbirds. You have the trumpet type flower that they can really get their beak into. Uh, Goldstrom rebecca, the goldfinch love the seeds on that. And you'll often see honeybees uh, on top getting the nectar and also butterflies. Lupine, you can see a, a tiger swallowtail here um, getting the nectar from the, the lupine. A honeybee on sedum. Uh, this, was, this is a native uh, called nine bark. Uh, summer wine is the variety. So it's more of a native R in comparison to the true native, which is green. And then you have panicum, another native type grass. Uh, Ilex verticillata, which you have berries. So it offers seasonal interest. So all of this is like pollen, uh, nectar. Uh, it's got berries, water, shelter. So you have a variety of different things that are needed for an optimum garden to attract wildlife and better pollination. So some of our pollinators are bees, wasps. Uh, it could be even a bumblebee. Uh, the honeybees are what we really want to attract because uh, you know, getting the food for the bees to have honey and then also for us is always a benefit. Uh, we have butterflies and moths, birds, and also bats. So the bats will eat the mosquitoes and they'll also get the nectar off of a lot of different kinds of plants. Uh, I wanted to bring up microorganisms because you wanna also think about your soil and having good soil and starting from the base, working your way up is an important part about establishing a good garden. And plant diversity. So plant diversity, you may want, uh, maybe you love, an all yellow flower garden. But then you wanna also think about like certain insects will be attracted to certain colors. So you may want to incorporate a few different colors in order to attract different insects, um, butterflies, bees, and even birds. So having that diversity and host plants that 
um, like the monarchs will lay their eggs on uh, Asclepius or butterfly weed. Um, so you wanna make sure that you have enough of a host plant as well as nectar and food for the, 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 the pollinators to have through the season. And then eco-friendly practices. I just wanted to talk about this as well. Um, a wildflower garden is, or a wild, attracting wildlife, you want to keep it as healthy as possible. Just like we want to be as healthy as possible. The birds, the butterflies, the bees, they all also want to be as healthy as possible. So if you can reduce using any chemicals in your garden, that will also encourage more um, butterflies, birds, bees, to be attracted to your garden. And they also provide um, kind of a, a way of determining whether it is a healthy ecosystem. So creating your own wildflower ha wildlife habitat, um, these are things that you wanna consider. And I'll go over these throughout the presentation, but I wanted to have you consider them throughout the presentation to see Write down some names of plants that you might like, um, things that you, you think would be really great in a garden of your own. And maybe you already have certain plants. Maybe you wanna increase the numbers of those plants or add more diversity and add a new plant um, that will attract a certain type of wildlife in your, into your garden. So think about bloom times, blooming from early spring to late fall, um, having something that is going to be food for the, the wildlife throughout the, throughout the seasons. Um, and you also, you wanna think about not just the pollen and nectar, but all the way till it produces seeds and the birds are eating the seeds and the berries throughout the winter as well. So diversity of plants, um, texture and color, uh, all of that kind of plays a role in, in the whole look of the garden. You have texture and color of the tiny wine nine bark mixed with fire and ice hydrangea. And this is Carl Forrester reed grass. Uh, you have some echinacea and phlox, phlox. And at the bottom here, you have creeping thyme, which is also, it, it's an herb, but it has a beautiful flower. Uh, especially in June, but it, pro it proliferates throughout the season. Um, you'll have flowers at random times throughout the, throughout the year. And think about natives, host plants, uh, plants with higher pollen content, uh, eco-friendly techniques and products that you're using on your garden. Uh, think about safer soaps or um, things that are more organic. Uh, we use a, to control um, aphids, we'll use dish detergent and water and spray that on our plants, but it doesn't always affect the beneficial insects. So it's a, it's a good method to, to use on your plants. If you're having powdery mildew issues, I add baking soda to that mixture. So I do a uh, a tablespoon of dish detergent, two tablespoons of baking soda, and a gallon of water. And that mixture um, can be for fungus or, or insects. So it re really depends on what problems you're having in the garden, and but finding solutions that are also eco-friendly that will be absorbed in the environment that will not affect the wildlife around. <clears throat> um, and then, I also want to think about, you know, if you're putting in a wild wildlife habitat, a pollinator garden, let people know, like let people know why you're doing it and what is the, the purpose of it. So you can create a, a garden that has high pollen content. You have butterflies all over. You have monarchs proliferating. You have goldfinches on your Black Eyed Susan. You have like this whole ecosystem forming within your own yard, and it can be just um, a small postage stamp lot in the in Saratoga, or it could be a vast field that you have that you can create um, some edge gardens that will create a way to draw in that wildlife. 
and let people know, put up a sign. Um, it could be a pollinator garden. It could be a wildlife garden, but educate others. Like, why do you want to do this? And is it just for beauty or is it that we are creating a way to save our environment <laughs> and create healthy, a healthy ecosystem for all, whether it's for the, for us or the wildlife, um, but we can enjoy the beauty of our garden and enjoy the wildlife within our garden if you create the setting that is needed in order to enhance um, the, the way of attracting more wildlife to your garden. <clears throat> so attracting birds. Um, there's so many different kinds of birds and so many different uh, things that will certain birds like better than others. Some will like sunflower seeds, some will like the thistle. Um, but you want to attract birds because it does control some of the insects within the garden. Um, it may eat some of the good ones, <laughs> but it also will eat some of the bad insects or um, the larvae within the, the setting. Um, they're also beautiful to see, and it also provides a way to see if your ecosystem is uh, healthy within that setting. So they could be nesting in a, in a hydrangea or a lilac, and they, they might be um, eating the seeds of the bee bomb after they've, they've uh, flowered and now they've, they've started to go to seed. So it can be that maybe it's even the worms in the in your soil because you have nice healthy soil. You're attracting the good earthworms, and then they are going for what's in the soil. So um, there's a lot of uh, great benefits to having the beauty of birds within your garden. Um, and then they also dis they disperse seeds within your garden. So if you're naturalizing a setting, uh, let's say purple coneflower, um, echinacea they'll eat the seeds, but they'll also disperse some of them, whether it's within your garden and making it bigger or it goes into another area <laughs> um, over uh, into the next person's garden, which can be a, a nice benefit. Um, and that would also form the source of fertilizer where the seeds are actually dispersed that way as well. <clears throat> So the, here's a few um, beneficial birds. I just wanted to uh, give you an idea that they do eat things that are hurting your garden. Like bluebirds will eat grasshoppers and the grasshoppers will uh, form holes within the leaves of the plants or they may eat more than you want. Um, so there are a variety of different birds that, ha that have different hosts that they, they will they will eat. Attracting butterflies. So it's it. there's a couple things you wanna think about. So the great thing about butterflies are they're pollinators. Um, they are whimsical, they're beautiful, they're happy. When you see them in the garden, you think of your youthfulness and uh, the they're also an environmental indicator. So they are affected by pesticides more than other insects um, or other animals, I should say. So the larva uh, usually doesn't have much of an exoskeleton, so it um, can be affected by those pesticides faster. Um, and it also keeps the ecosystem in check. So is, do you have a healthy environment? Are you attracting butterflies? Are you providing host plants for the butterflies? Um, Asclepius for monarchs. The tiger swallowtail is on joe pie weed, which is, um, it's getting the pollen, uh, joe pie weed, Eupatorium. Uh, so there's a variety of different butterflies that you could attract to your garden that have different host plants. And with that, there's so many different host plants for different kinds of butterflies. So it's choosing and finding information about what butterflies you do want to attract to your garden. And, uh, and adding those host plants to the garden. Um, I often refer to books and uh, this one is called Bringing Nature Home uh, by Douglas Tallamy. And in this book, it has a variety of different butterflies and what their host 
plants are. So there's other books out there that will give you guidance or you can look on online and just make sure you have that checklist of what do you want in your garden and what do you want to attract uh, the most? What do you want to see the most in your garden? <clears throat> so lupin is one of the ones that I always think about for the Carner Blue Butterfly. And attracting the, the blue butterfly, you'll see signs up in the park. Um, I know there's a sign up at the Saratoga Dog Park and they don't, they have a no mow area. So then the lupin are able to proliferate, but it's not just lupin, it's other wildflowers within the, the meadow stage that helps in um, either pollination and host plants of uh, different, different plants acting as a host plant, as well as shelter for different um, species. So this is the Carner Blue Butterfly. The wild lupin I find grows best in sandy soil, but there's a cultivated lupin that grows best with a little bit more uh, organic matter. So sometimes the cultivated ver version versus the wild version may be slightly different requirements whether it's lupin or another variety. <clears throat> so our traditional, our, our love, love, the love of our life, the monarch butterfly, um, you can see the larva in the top photo and then the butterfly in the bottom photo. And this is on Asclepias tuberosa, the orange butterfly weed. Um, we've had some of these at our greenhouse and they have even started to lay eggs on some of the plants um, within our greenhouse. And it's, it's exciting because customers have pointed it out to us. And it's like, wow, it, we're creating a habitat just on our benches with pots, and then they can actually bring them home. So that's kind of a fun little, um, <clears throat> you know, surprise sometimes that happens. But if you have just one plant, it may be okay. It may be enough host plant. Uh, but you may want to think about putting in three or four or five um, to create a cluster so there's enough food there for the larva to feed on. And obviously, there, there's a lot of pollen within the, um, the flowers itself. But I think having the host plant is really, really important, having enough of it. And this is a variety of other Asclepias um, that the monarch could lay their eggs on. So you can just see uh, how there's so much variation in colors. It's not just one type. <clears throat> so the benefits of bees, you know, they're often called the perfect pollinator because what insect do you think of that gets right in between each flower petal? and gets underneath and it moves the petals and it pollinates each of those flowers. And then it brings the pollen back to its hive and creates honey. And it's just like, I can't think of any other insect that creates such benefit within our environment. Um, you know, a lot of people are scared of bees and I totally understand that or they might be allergic to them but there is like, so it's so important to encourage the bees in a certain habitat so they have enough food and they can pollinate our flowers and we're able to, um, they're able to pollinate and create seeds and proliferate the plants over, over time. Uh, the bees are also an, an ecosystem indicator. Um, there are many, uh, I would say different environments within our, um, our localized area that we're, we're getting more developed and more um, land where the natural bees, the honeybees might have been in a tree or uh, you know have its own kind of space, it's harder for them to find the homes that they need. So having beehives and incorporating um, some sort of you know, system where beekeepers can actually produce more honey I, the bees travel uh, at least a mile. I think they travel even further to collect their pollen. So um, even if there's a beehive somewhat lo somewhat close, it could be that those honeybees are coming to your garden and pollinating as well. So it's uh it's really it's really fascinating how they work. If uh, 
I, I think we should take a video and a time-lapse video on the bees and how they're <laughs> creating. It's just a fascinating thing that they do. So. <clears throat> so pollinators and pollination. So that's what's happening is the bees, the butterflies, the birds, uh, the wind, um, it's all helping move pollen uh, from the stamen to the pistil and creating seeds and fruit from there. Uh, it's regenerating uh, the, the plants. So oftentimes um, you could have a sterile uh, plant because it wasn't pollinated, such as uh, I would say if you think about pumpkins and gourds and squash, they all need strong pollination in order to produce fruit um, or the vegetable. So in order for them, that's why a lot of times you see honeybee hives near a farmer's field. Um, you want as many pumpkins as you can uh, produce in that space. So the bees will help in pollinating all of those pumpkins. Um, you know, the, if you don't have enough pollinators in the area, then, uh, you're going to have less fruit or less, uh, proliferation of that, of that plant. <clears throat> and then obviously it creates a healthy ecosystem, uh, for wildlife, plants, pollinators, uh, from the soil all the way up, um, you know, creating a healthy, healthy soil with rich organic matter, compost, produces a healthy plant, um, strong, lots of nutrients within that plant. And then the pollinators come and they pollinate and they get the ne nectar and they get all the nutrients, the maximum amount of nutrients that they could get. And then they go and they uh, pollinate and the seeds are formed and then regeneration happens. So it's pretty exciting. So think about um, design and purpose and what you want in your garden. Um, is it textural? Is it artistic? Um, is it the colors of the flowers? Is it providing the most pollen? Um, choose your plants wisely. And maybe it's all native. Like a lot of the native plants are gonna encourage more of the wildlife to come to your garden. Um, they're natural and they, they fit in the environment. Uh, the wildlife have gone to these plants for years and years and years. The milkweed is on the side of the road and the, they proliferate <clears throat> just in the, in the meadows, as an example. Here's a garden, um, just a few different uh, high pollination, uh, high pollen rates in the, the anise hyssop is in the back here, agastache or anise hyssop. Uh, if you come by our greenhouse on a hot sunny day, the bees are loving the anise hyssop. Um, and they will spread their seed, they'll, they'll naturalize <clears throat> in an area. Goldstrom rebecca, high pollinator, and then sedum. This is probably in August before it start, started to turn pink or red. Um, but once it turns pink or red, then the bees are very attracted to it because it, it's almost like honey. <clears throat> Here you can see a bumblebee on Allium. And then the hummingbirds absolutely love Kirkosmia. Uh, the hummingbirds, butterflies, and uh, bees love the Heliopsis. So these, this is a July blooming garden and it creates a setting where you have plants that are blooming at different times. Um, in the back here is Baptisia, which is a native, and that blooms in May. And then you also have Montauk Daisy in the front here, which will bloom in October. Um, some grasses for a little bit of shelter. And I believe in the back there's delphinium and yarrow as well. The yarrow is a yellow yarrow that provides good pollen as well. So I just wanted to show you a few gardens that have high pollinators and could be used as uh, attracting wildlife. Um, the purple cone flowers have a high um, 
pollen count, phlox, Heliopsis. <clears throat> uh, and then think about ad adding additions to your garden that will attract some of the wildlife. So bird houses, bat houses, more ho host plants, uh, succession of blooms, having something blooming all the time uh, will encourage more pollinators to come to your garden. Diversity in heights, so you have some shelter and think about incorporating perennials, shrubs, and trees because they can all be host plants depending on which species you're trying to attract. And possibly add a water feature and it could just be um, <clears throat> a fountain or something like that. So uh, creating it to be eco-friendly, maybe you wanna put in a rain barrel and you can use this to water your garden. Um, some of the plants may need a little extra at times, um, most of, <clears throat> if you're adding native plants, a lot of time they'll naturalize to the environment um, and they may not need that extra sense of water. But on really dry occasions, the rain barrels could be a nice additive. And this is at a corner of a house, but it could be, maybe you have a gardening shed and it could just be a rain barrel next to your gardening shed. Um, so just a, a few eco-friendly eco thoughts. Bird feeders, uh, attracting the birds, especially during the winter to keep them at your garden. Uh, a bat house, this is on a tree, but I've also seen them on chimneys uh, where you're attracting the bats and it's creating a good ecosystem within. And bird houses, so attract a way for, for birds to actually nest. And maybe there's uh, a certain type of bird that you're trying to attract and they, do, they like nesting boxes versus uh, a plant material. <clears throat> Water features, uh, you can install uh, a pond, uh, put some pollinators along the outside, uh, some plant material that would fit in that setting. Uh, this is a great example for butterflies because they can get out of the water pretty easily, but there's a little bit of water for them to drink up and possibly a bird fountain, um, a fountain where the birds can get a little drink, uh, maybe the edge, the butterflies could, you know, just get a little drink as well. So think about these things for adding to your garden. Uh, this is just a list of different um, perennials that could give you succession in bloom time. So, um, most of these are natives or native ours. And this is just a list, but our next photo is a picture of all of those plants. So you have Baptisia early in the spring. Um, in the front of that is Centuria Montana, Mountain Bluet. You have a white yarrow, Dianthus, Heliopsis, Summer Sun, Coreopsis. Um, Geranium, this is Roseanne, and then this is Biocovo, Coreopsis moonbeam, um, Coreopsis sunburst blooms a little bit earlier than the moonbeam does. And then you have Lupin coming into bloom, Monarda, Bee Balm, Lucelvia, Veronicastrum, um, Culver's root is a common name. Orange butterfly weed, Asclepius, or another type of Asclepius could be substituted. Kercosmia, attracting those hummingbirds. Love that one. Um, Allium is right next to it. Phlox. Uh, Echinacea and black-eyed Susans. We have uh, Helenium. And Sedum. There's a variety of different sedums that you could use. So you can see this provides so much color and so much uh, variation that you have different host plants within. So um, you'll have larva of certain butterflies on the Baptisia and the yarrow and the, the Heliopsis, or it's providing the pollen um, for them as food throughout the season. So having a source of pollen will help the wildlife still come to your garden throughout the whole season. 
And I also included um, a sequence of blue tongues for shrubs and trees. So some of these are native and some are not, but I wanted to include a pollen source for you, um, whether it's, uh, you know, it, it doesn't really, I guess it'll attract different, different um, types of wildlife. So the Wigilia have more of a trumpet shaped flower and the hummingbirds absolutely love that, the Wigilia. Uh, we have lilacs in the spring, viburnums. Uh, this is a little quick fire hydrangea and a bobo hydrangea, uh, both creating pollen uh, mid-July. And then this is on the bottom is Ilex verticillata. So think about the food for the birds later on in the season. Uh, so this is just a, a variety of different um, from from spring to fall of what could provide pollen or habitats for different wildlife within your garden. <clears throat> um, this may be a, a, the perennial list and the shrub list may be something um, we can send to you at a later time. Um, nine bark, summer wine nine bark, panicum, both natives. Um, the wild, the birds could hide under there. They can find food. It can be shelter. It provides a little bit of height where you can have other plants in front. Uh, snowball viburnum, you can see forms a beautiful flower in May, but then beautiful berries in the fall. So uh, it has different seasonal characteristics that that will attract the the, the pollen. Uh, will be high in the in the viburnum and actually the hummingbirds get into the center um, of the viburnum and they love that. Um, and the berries that are formed on the viburnum uh, attract the birds throughout the summer and into the fall. And then this is Ilex verticillata also offering berries within um, for food for the season. Think about trees. Uh, this is a, a river birch. Um, the birch trees are birch, maple, oak. Uh, they're often host plants for a lot of different wildlife. Um, it could be that it's on the outskirts outskirt, of your property or the next yard has uh, an oak tree. Um, it doesn't have to be in your own space if you have a smaller, smaller yard. Uh, and then focus on what you have in creating your wildlife, wildlife garden. Um, think about the space and what is going to give you the most benefit for that space. <clears throat> this picture I thought was helpful um, just to see like different contrast of colors and bloom times. So this is a flowering dogwood. You have some viburnums and a magnolia. Uh, this is a uh, Aeschylus, uh, horse chestnut. Uh, there was a Rose of Sharon over here. So you have different bloom times within the trees and shrubs. But then if you take out some of this lawn and create it into a pollinator garden, you could have so much more beauty in that space. And so it's almost like an open palette, an open painting. Like what can I paint in there that is going to not just be a picture, but offer a lot of benefits for the wildlife. So maybe it's a, you know, a succession planting of some of those, the ones that I suggested, uh, Baptisia, Asclepius, uh, Coreopsis, Sedum. So there's a, a lot of choices. Um, the native plantings are something that is going to definitely attract more wildlife. Um, you create a healthy wild ecosystem and uh, provide food and pollination and host plants for the uh, different wildlife. There's a lot more um, information, I think, to the, to the specific host plants for specific species. So specific host plants for certain butterflies or um, specific host plants for certain birds, uh, you know, so there's a little bit more research to be done on, you know, what you actually would want in your garden. But 
you always know the monarchs love Asclepius, <laughs> the butterfly weeds. So um, that's always a winner. And um, you also want to think about your soil, uh, water, and light within your garden. So um, if a plant is requiring shade, you want to make sure that it's planted in half a day of sun to full shade, depending on its requirements. Um, so think about the, the setting and choosing the right plants for those settings. <clears throat> uh, Echinacea is one of my favorites. This one is called Powwow Wild Berry. Um, it, the more opened uh, seed heads like this have more pollen in them than the double uh, of the echinacea. So the double echinacea are very unique and different, but it doesn't have quite as much pollen content as the more open flowers and cones. <clears throat> uh, this one is brown-eyed Susan, Rebecca, Goldstrom Rebecca. Um, it, it, you know, I think that choosing plants that will bloom for a long period of time are really important, but these are a few natives that we're talking about. Uh, the Joe pie weed or Eupatorium purpurea, uh, you can see it in, in flower, uh, beautiful pinkish purple flowers, but then it forms seed heads. So you're providing an ecosystem for butterflies <clears throat> for a host plant um, and pollen for butterflies, bees, uh, as well as forming the seed heads, which the birds are enjoying eating throughout the, the rest of the season and fall and winter, if you leave them up. Um, the, I guess the drawback of that is I have had them in random spots come up. So they have uh, self-seeded in spots I might not enjoy them. So I would just dig them up and put them into another spot that I would prefer them to be. They do proliferate fast. And then panicum is a, a native grass. Uh, this one is called Dallas Blue. And I love this in the fall, I would say midsummer and fall. It's one of my favorites because I can also use it as a dried flower. <laughs> it holds up really, really wonderfully. <clears throat> Annabelle hydrangea is one of the, the native hydrangeas. Um, and then you have Shalone or Turtlehead. This is the, the pink version, but the white one I have often seen uh, alongside riverbanks in the, in the natural environment. Um, Rubecchia as well. Uh, some more Annabelle hydrangea. Uh, this is Semisifuga or Actea, and there is a high pollen con content on this. This doesn't start blooming until September. So it is a later bloom, but the bees seem to absolutely adore it. And I, I think it's a nice addition to the garden. And then you can see a, a, the pink turtle head in this space. I love this one too, because it blooms in August and September where some things are waning and the turtle head is just coming on beautifully. <clears throat> uh, another list of certain native perennials that um, are native to our area that could be available uh, through local garden centers. We have a good portion of the varieties on this list and these are true natives. And this is, uh, this year I got some new seeds. So I'm really excited. Um, I'm going to be growing a few more different kinds of wildflowers than, than we've grown in the past uh, that are native to our area. Um, another setting where you have bee balm in the back and Annabelle hydrangea in full bloom, Goldstrom rubecchia, and you have some sedum. And then there's a few annuals planted here. So the zinnias offer a little extra pollination. <clears throat> oh, and then there's a uh, Zagreb. Coreopsis, which is a brighter yellow. Great pollinators. <clears throat> Lots of pollen count on all, on all of those. This is a type of meadow sage. And then we also have feverfew in this section. And also um, feverfew kind of blooms sporadically through the season. It's heavily blooming in June. And then it um, goes through kind of a period of time where the blooms aren't as 
prolific. If you cut it back, then it will bloom again in the fall. And this uh, meadow sage, this variety does continuously bloom throughout the whole season. So having those um, plants that will continuously bloom are definitely worthwhile to add to your garden. Uh, this is not all native. They, there's Asiatic lilies in here, but there are a few natives. So you have Blazing Star or Liatris in the back. You have a yellow yarrow um, in the back of that. And the butterflies love the, the yarrow. You have some Coreopsis in the front here. Um, there's Blue Veronica. Uh, but you can see the daisies, lambs, uh, lamb's ear, Russian sage. Um, there's a few zinnias added to this garden for a little extra pollinator, uh, pollination, extra pollen within the garden. Um, this garden will attract a lot of butterflies um, and actually birds. So you'll have a good variety of wildlife coming to this garden. Through here, we have Annabelle hydrangea and Anis hyssop. Phlox, uh, there's a uh, Rebecca in a couple spots. Um, you have some taller grasses that'll provide a little bit of shade and you have uh, arborvitae or cedar trees here that will also provide shade. And the birdhouse will attract uh, bluebirds to come to this space um, unless a tree small um, comes in as well. So there's a variety of different things in bloom here. And then as the season progresses, different things change and more things will come into bloom. <clears throat> this is a great butterfly garden where you have, have purple coneflower and sedum, uh, rubecchia, there's a few daylilies. There's milkweed in this section, Asclepius. And you can see the pods are forming in this section. Um, and then Russian sage is on the edge. <clears throat> uh, this garden is blooming early. So you, you have succession of different plants. So daylilies, primrose, uh, lamb's ear, uh, looks like some roses are in bloom, maybe a delphinium. Uh, I think in the back here, it looks like firea. And this is the same garden from a different angle, but toward the fall. So you have the sedum and hydrangeas. Um, uh, we have some annuals incorporated um, in a couple spots to add a little extra color. And then we have a large nine bark uh, also providing shade for uh, wildlife or n a nesting place. <clears throat> Uh, more echinacea. I just, I love this one. It's one of my favorite, favorite plants, um, the powwow wild berry echinacea. And then think about your design and textures together. This is a uh, tiny wine or little devil nine bark, um, fire and ice hydrangea. And this hydrangea has small little buds as well as more opened flowers on the outside. And the buds actually have a lot more pollen on them than the actual florets. So it, it's wonderful for a, pollinate, a high pollen content, but it's also great if it's raining or snowing. The, the weight of the rain or the snow doesn't bring down the, the whole uh, shrub. It still stays upright because all the petals are not weighting it down and catching all the, the rain or the snow. <clears throat> so I do love that. And think about thyme um, and other herbs for your garden. Uh, there's a uh, mountain mint that I, I love that one because it flowers and I use it in cut flower bouquets. So then you can actually have it as a fragrance as well as a beautiful accent flower. <clears throat> and let's see, this is more Dallas blue uh, panicum. This one is a native and behind here is uh, it's either Coreopsis, the yellow, or the summer sun uh, Heliopsis. I'm guessing it's Coreopsis because it's lower to the ground and Heliopsis would be a little bit taller, like four feet. <clears throat> so uh, textures together, the lamium, uh, this is Korean reed grass, echinacea, phlox, 
the textures together just really stand out and then they have a long blooming period. <clears throat> Hydrangeas can provide that shade underneath. Um, the sedum underneath here has a lot of pollen that uh, the butterflies and the bees just absolutely love. Um, you do have some spireas here, which are not native, but um, they do provide some pollen for uh, different species. And a few roses too that are uh, coming, coming in and out of bloom. <clears throat> so here you have some tall grasses and the, the grasses accent each other nicely, but provide shade at the base. So you can have wildlife kind of zooming through um, and then we also have a spirea uh, where I've seen bird's nest within, and then you have spring blooming, and then we have Goldstrom Rebecca at the front, which provides a uh, July, August blooming time. <clears throat> so think about annuals, adding a few annuals to your garden. If you have a garden where a lot of perennials, oh, I have, gar I have a beautiful garden, but it's only blooming in June and July. So you have to think about how do I extend that garden? What plants do I need to add? And um, is it going to be uh, something that is a perennial? Is it a shrub? Is it something that I, I want as a focal plant point in the garden? Or do I want it as a hedge? And if I want it as a hedge, do I want it flowering? Is it gonna flower or is it gonna form berries? How am I gonna feed the wildlife? How am I gonna attract nature to my garden? Um, so if you have an area that stays more green like this, um, what am I going to add to that space to give it a, a more of a pop or whether it's a visual pop or a pop that says, you know, the butterflies really want to come and, you know, get the nectar from those plants. So, uh, you know, some of it is a little bit of research on which species you want to attract to your garden. And then other times it's just about um, producing a, a garden that has that succession of blooms. And that can be done, the succession of blooms is just asking. And I have that list on here that you can refer to, um, but you can go to a garden center and see what's in bloom or go to a garden center and be like, okay, I don't have a July blooming plant, you go and you can see what's in bloom in July and you can add that to your garden. Um, sometimes it's a little bit off in the, the, um, the timing, but the more you ask, the more you read tags, the more research you do. Um, at our greenhouse, we're open to ask, you know, answering any questions and we have a few maps for long blooming gardens too. So it's helpful um, as a reference point. But here you can see lots of zinnias. And we also have Calibracoa, so you have uh, uh, the, mi the mini petunias, uh, more of the trumpet-shaped flower, and then uh, more of the center pollen being very exposed. <clears throat> you have Shasta daisies, and I believe the tall purple is Liatris, and Coreopsis, um, Blue Salvia, so there's a variety of different plants in this garden that will attract wildlife throughout the season. <clears throat> More annuals to add to your garden. Uh, this is an attractive window box hanging on uh, one of the rails at the Oklahoma track. Um, but you can see the hummingbirds would be attracted to the Calibracoa um, and even the geraniums. And the butterflies love the biddens and so do the bees. So, <clears throat> Beautiful and functional. Blue ageratum is one of the butterfly's uh, favorites as well. They land on the top and they are able to get a lot of pollen out of that space. You have a, a phlox and a, a wishbone flower. <clears throat> Another great garden that has perennials in the back and then a few mm -hmm. annuals in the front. And the annuals in the front just add a little bit of color throughout the season. Um, oh, this is a fun plant in the front. It's like a chartreuse green color, uh, but the leaves itself are kind of cool because they catch raindrops. So um, they, uh, 
it kind of provides a little bit of moisture within the garden. So um, after it rains, you'll see little droplets on the leaves. It's fun to walk by with uh, kids too, because they're, they're mystified by that. <clears throat> Um, another garden with perennials as well as annuals. So add some annuals if you feel like you need more pollen in your garden to attract the, the good um, species within your garden. And it also is attractive on your eye. So always think about that too. What do you wanna see out your back door? Uh, what do you wanna see when you drive in your driveway? <clears throat> This is also a mixture of uh, zinnias and grasses and perennials, echinacea, uh, shasta daisies, rubecchia. Uh, we have blue salvia, uh, coral bells. So it also offers a huge amount of pollen within as well as beauty. You have different heights, zinnias in the backdrop. Uh, hydrangeas in the backdrop. So you have some shrubs as well as perennials that come back every year and then added annuals for that extra pollen <clears throat> to be added to your garden and beauty. Through this slide, uh, you can see different perennial grasses in the background. Um, there's actually a few shrubs in the space as well. You have uh, Coreopsis in this area, sedum, and then I see mostly annuals. So um, let's see, Gumfrina, Cleome, Zinnias, Blue Salvia. This is the annual version, Victoria Blue. And Gumfrina is the purple here. And Celosia, Pink Candle, and Profusion Zinnias. Uh, and more Gumfrina at the base. So you have a good variety through here. I also wanted to point out um, in the last presentation I did, people were like, oh, but I want to attract wildlife, but I don't want to attract deer. So how do I, <laughs> how do, I do that? I want like my um, garden to be beautiful and functional. And I want all of the goodness, um, the good bugs. I want the good, you know, birds to come. And, but the deer keep coming into my yard. I plant a lot of Cleome because it has a scent to it. Um, it's a little bit skunky, but it's a beautiful flower. And the deer seem to stay a little bit farther away for a little bit longer. So I plant Cleome around my gardens and they it, all, it acts like a little bit of a natural fence. Um, as long as I can keep them away from the good stuff uh, before they actually get a taste of it. So. Uh, you know, think about what you're going to plant that could offer that little bit of uh, barrier. It could be hot peppers, um, or if you're really having trouble, like a hot pepper spray is also helpful. <clears throat> so the National Wildlife uh, Federation has created a program where you can actually certify your garden. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. That would be fun. Um, and they give you a sign and it's, uh, they have certain requirements to make it a certified wildlife ha habitat. Um, and, you know, you just have to go through the checkoff list. Most of the items on there are making sure that you are incorporating native plants and having a source of water, food and shelter. So it's, it is a little bit of a checkoff list. I think it costs $20 to cert certify your, your garden. But I thought that could be a fun way to educate others and really promote your, your garden and be like, oh, well, I have a certified wildlife habitat in my yard. <laughs> I think that could be fun. Um, and the Audubon Society also has like signs, uh, pollinate, pollinator friendly garden. So like, let people know what you're doing. Like, it's not just a garden. It's like more than a garden. It's providing a source of food, shelter, you know, water, all of these things that are needed in order to make our environment health, healthier. So think about educating, whether it's a sign or just talking with your neighbors. Um, I think the more we can like promote good practices in our gardening, um, the better off all of us will be. Uh, this is just a list of a few sources that I've used um, the Saratoga Tree Nursery has a spring and fall sale and they often have native plants. 
uh, that you're able to, they're usually very small, um, but they're a good way to start some of the native plants in your garden. Um, Cornell Cooperative Extension is always a good resource. Uh, and I did include um, the Sierra Club and National Wildlife Federation, Audubon Society. They all have like really good information um, that can help uh, in guiding you uh, to, to a healthy garden setting. And then of course at Ballet Flowers, we have fantastic plants that can get you started too. <laughs> so create your own wildflower habitat, make it your own, um, increase the amount of pollen in your garden, uh, get it to be eco-friendly where um, it can kind of take care of itself. So you have like the taller plants, it could be trees, shrubs, uh, annuals, perennials, if you can create a setting that's beautiful for you to look at and you to be like, I'm so proud of my garden and I love everything in it. Um, it's because there's succession and there's bloom time, you know, at random times of the year, um, but staggered in a way that's planned. Um, I think that all of us can create gardens that are, what you want it to be. So I've created gardens within our setting and I'm, a, I'm always like, oh, I wanna do this and I wanna add that. And I'm like, where am I gonna do it? So sometimes I get to do it at other people's yards, but then we're creating a new garden at our, at our place. Um, so I always, I think my initial thought is how do I get color all the time? whether it's through shrubs or perennials. Um, and that's my initial thought. And then I put my, I put a spin on it and I'm like, okay, well, do I want it to have more of a purpose? So if I want to attract wildlife, which shrubs do I need to have in my landscape? And put a little bit more thought in, involved in it besides just knowing the bloom times. Um, adding those specific species, I think are really, important. So, um, and educate others, share your garden, be proud of it, and let everybody know about your garden and what you're doing in it, and talk with neighbors, join a garden club, um, talk to the master gardeners at Cornell Cooperative Extension, like people that love to garden love to talk about gardens. So it's really fun to share all of the ideas that are you're coming up with. <clears throat> this is a new garden. Um, so start with good soil at the base, good compost, uh, start with good healthy plants. In this garden, we have Rebecca Indian Summer, uh, Phlox, a couple different varieties, Panicum, um, I think that, and, and a little bit of iris. So the iris will bloom in the spring <clears throat> and then it'll go into Rebecca and Phlox. And there's also, I think, sedum in there in the back. Um, so it just is getting different flowers at different times. So it may not look big and lush at first, but you just have to get started somewhere. So good soil, good plants, create a plan. Um, hydrangeas, phlox, rudbeckia, echinacea, and texture. We have grasses. We have, oh, this is purple sand cherry in the back, uh, hydrangea, phlox. And that concludes the presentation. Thank you for joining us today on uh, creating a wildflower, wild, wild, <laughs> wildlife habitat. I just love the whole presentation and um, sharing all of the information and, and information about plants and, incor and incorporating a way to incorporate wildlife into your garden as well. Thank you so much.